So we have tonight meeting left this Friday, tonight, Friday night, and also Sunday night at six o'clock. And so we would be glad if you could join us for tonight and Sunday night. Now tonight, the two words that we're gonna be taking up, uh, maybe a little similar to some words we've discussed in the past, but yet very different, are the words profit and loss. Profit and loss, they're financial terms uh, and terms that everyone is familiar with. If you've ever invested money, if you've ever done something where you were looking to get a return back, you'd say, so much of life is measured by profit and by loss. We're going to read some of the greatest financial statements about the spiritual life ever made. They were made by the Lord Jesus Christ, and we're going to read them tonight in Mark 8 and verse 35. We're going to read verses 35 and 36, and we're going to discuss what the Lord Jesus had to say about loss. Tonight, I'm going to speak on loss. Matt's going to speak on profit. And hopefully we'll be able to share the good news of Jesus Christ with you through these two words. Mark 8 and verse 35. These are the words of the Lord Jesus. And he says, for whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospels shall save it. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? We'll read those verses one more time. The Lord Jesus says, For whosoever will save his life will lose it. But whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospels, the same shall save it. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for for his soul. We know that God will bless the reading of his word. When you think of financial gain and loss, I don't know if everybody's aware of this, and a lot of us have, by default, a lot of investments in the stock market through our investment, through our work, through our retirement fund, and the largest percent, the largest uh, decrease, the largest loss that has ever existed just took place, just took place about three or four months ago on March 15th there, March 16th, where the stock market just tumbled, it sank, it almost lost 3,000 points in one day, and the world looked on. And what was so astonishing is that what caused the largest loss that has ever been seen on the financial market was something that the human eye can't even see. Something you couldn't see with your own eye caused the largest financial loss ever known to man. It was just a virus that caused this tremendous loss. And so we realize that the economies of Earth are so, they're so volatile, that they're so fragile. Something you can't see could cause devastation the world over when it comes to financial things. There's also a lot that we learn about ourselves through investment. If you looked at what were the most profitable stocks to invest in over the past 10 years, it tells you something about you and I. One of them was Netflix. Maybe we're watching too much TV. Maybe we need to get out a little more. Netflix was the number one, number one stock to invest in. Another one was Amazon. I would encourage each one of us to stop ordering things just to see boxes come to your front door. We need to do something else. We need to you know, stop buying, we would say. Another one was Ulta. Ulta, the beauty parlor or the beauty, the, the, the shop that sells all things for cosmetics. Once again, we'd say, no one's going out lately. I don't understand. But still, people are consumed with how they look. They're consumed with being entertained. They love to get things. And this shows in what we spend our money on and what is so valuable in investments. I was even talking to someone recently about Tesla. And Tesla has been a company that has never turned a profit in its entire history. And yet this year, for the first time, it has turned a profit and it gets to go to stock heaven. If you don't know what that is, you can ask someone. It, it, the, the stock Tesla it gets to go to this index. It's almost like going to heaven for stocks because it was profitable for one year. I ask you, listener tonight, when we look at the investments of this life, how profitable do we have to be to get to heaven? How profitable do we have to be to get to heaven. 
And what does our investment say about us? The things that we find that we're dumping our lives into and spending on, what does it say about you and I? And more than that, I have an answer tonight from the Bible that something your eye has never seen is the key to your greatest prophet. And that is the man, Jesus Christ. I has never seen him. Blessed are they who have not seen and yet have believed. Because here is the man who determines heaven's economy. And he determines your state of whether your life will show up in the lost column or in the prophet column. But it's him and only him. And tonight, hopefully, we can say something about that. I looked at this verses that the verses that we've been reading tonight. And I want to talk about three things. Losing a life losing the soul, and losing all things. To lose a life, to lose a soul, to lose all things. The Lord Jesus Christ here, he says very strange, very strange comment. It has bewildered people. He says, if you want to gain your life, if you want to save it, you have to lose it. He says, if you want to, if you want to hold on, if you want to save this life, you'll lose it. He shows us this profit, this profit margin, and he says, this life, its profit is found in when people, when people choose to lose their own life. You say, ah, oh, it doesn't make sense. What in the world could he mean? You know, I look at life and I think of all the important things that we consider of value. I think of all the things that we do day to day, the time that I spend, what I consider to be important, how people perceive me. And I think, oh, I'm doing all that so that at the end of my life, they will reflect and they will say, you know what kind of life he had? And they will say something wonderful about me. Maybe they'll print something wonderful on my tombstone. Maybe in my obituary, it'll say something wonderful that people thought about me, but it'll be about what I did with my life. You see, the Lord Jesus says here something tremendous. He says this, if you want your life to really matter, you'll realize that it doesn't matter unless you have the life of Christ. It will not matter to save my life, to my passions, my desires, my wants. If, if they come first, I will lose this life, guaranteed, hands down, because Jesus Christ says it. But if I want this life to be saved, I have to place my trust in another life, the life of Christ. The Bible says that. It's so significant. In Galatians 2 and 20, the Bible says this, I have been crucified with Christ, and the life I now live in this flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. It's no longer me. It's the life of Jesus Christ who loved me and gave himself for me. That is a tremendous truth tonight because we are all working to be more important and more valuable, and we want people to think more of us, but yet Jesus Christ says this, Unless your top priority, unless your greatest investment in life is in another life, Jesus Christ, you'll lose it. You'll lose this life. It won't matter all that you have at the end of this life. The only thing you can bring past the grave is the life of Christ. Everything else will remain behind. And so here, the Lord Jesus, he says it in words very succinct. They may bewilder you because we do everything in order to make ourselves more valuable to God. But it's all in vain because God is not looking for us to make ourselves more valuable. We were as valuable as we could ever be the day we were born. And God looked at souls that come into this world and not a, not a dime of value could be added to them because they were priceless. The only thing that could be added to a life is salvation. If you're realizing that it's not what I do, it's what he did. It's not my life. It's his life. Lose this life, gain his life. That's what the Lord Jesus says. He says not only about losing this life, he says, what happens if you lose a soul? I think about there's such risk in losing this life in order to gain Christ. But what, what a return, what a return there is on this soul. Think about it. To lose my soul, the Lord Jesus says, I could gain the world. I could gain the world in exchange for this soul. And you say, Dave, how foolish. Who would ever do that? I ask you, are you doing that? How important is it to you 
on this Friday in July, how important is it to you to know that your soul will be in heaven? Because your answer to that tells me that maybe you're exchanging your soul for this world. You say, well, what else can it be exchanged for? The Bible tells me, what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? I can tell you about a man who gave his life in exchange for your soul, Jesus Christ. He died at Calvary, and he's, his soul was made an offering for sin to save your soul. Tonight, you have the option to lose your soul or to lose your sin. It's so clear, and it's so true. The world looks so glorious at times, and everything in it seems to sparkle, and yet this world is so temporary. If, if, if the world were just this and eternity couldn't be seen, you'd say, who would ever exchange their soul for the world? I hope that maybe that's something you're thinking about tonight, that you would say, it's not my life. I could lose my life and gain his life. I don't have to lose my soul because I could believe that he died for my soul. What a tremendous thing to know that I could be forgiven, that I could be bought with a price by Jesus Christ who gave his life for me. So not only losing life, not only losing soul, but I love this statement, and maybe we'll hear more about it. Losing all things, losing all things. That's what the Apostle Paul says in Philippians 3. You can go read the verse later. It's a tremendous verse, and he says, I would lose all things. And you know what he talks about? He talks about where he was born. He talks about his religion. He talks about his culture. Some of us come from very great cultures of which our lives are consumed with our culture. He talks about his family. Some of us, family is everything. He talks about his occupation and our jobs are everything. And he says, my job, my religion, my family, my culture. He says, everything. He said, it was all lost. It was all lost and I would lose it all in order to gain the knowledge of Jesus Christ, my Lord. Is that what you think? Would you exchange culture, family, religion, job, whatever it is? Would you say, you know what? It is not important when compared to knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord, to lose all that. You'd say, oh, that would be such a tremendous loss. Sometimes it looks that way, but not so, my friend. When you stand to gain Jesus Christ, what an opportunity tonight. You say not to, not to hang on to this life, but to lose it in order to gain the life that Christ offers. To not lose this soul because Christ died for the ungodly, but to lose all things in order to gain the knowledge of Jesus Christ, my Lord. Terrific statement mentioned about Jesus Christ. You can read about it. In John chapter 18, it says this about Jesus Christ. People who believe on him, this is what it says about him. He loses none of them. He never loses one. It comes from his lips. He says, I have lost none. None. Imagine a man, when it comes down to the end of his, you'd say in his entirety, he just has nothing of loss. Some people could say, oh, I made some good investments, some bad, and I... That, that one I lost, and well, that one I gained. Jesus Christ says this, those that believe on him, he loses none, not a single soul. Everyone he gains who believe on him, that he took their place and died instead of them. You could have the life that he offers. You could lose your sin and not your soul. And you could know that the most important gain, the most important profit in this life is Christ and knowing him as the one who was crucified for me. It's so significant at the end of the day because heaven is not looking for profitable people. It is not. Everybody else is. Everybody else in this world is looking for profitable people, not heaven. Heaven wants spiritual beggars. It wants people who are destitute and don't have a dime when it comes to things that are spiritual. It wants people that are in debt. Why? Because it knows a man who paid a price that you could not pay. It knows the man who has defined heaven's economy. And heaven's currency is precious blood. And Christ shed that in order to save you. To save your life. To save your soul. To put you 
and to the column of those that Christ has gained and he loses no one. Tonight you could believe on him that he died for your soul and this great economic system that has been set up of what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? You could answer tonight and say, it's not what I'm gonna exchange, it's what he exchanged. And thank God he did it for me in order to save me. We pray tonight as you continue to listen to Matt, you will realize the profit there is in knowing Christ as your savior, knowing that these loss or losses that we have talked about, they're fundamental to understanding the gospel, but nothing, there's nothing that is compared to knowing the profit and the worth and the value and the salvation of your soul. We pray that you would know so tonight as you continue to listen to Matt speak. Thanks, Dave. We're going to read uh, one verse, uh, and it's found in Philippians chapter 3. And it says these words, and it's very interesting that um, although we're speaking about two different things, loss and profit, I'm going to take up profit tonight. Dave's message and mine are weaved in together quite nicely. So uh, Philippians chapter 3 in verse 8, Paul's speaking here, and he says, Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung that I may win Christ and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness, which is of God by faith that I may know him is what he says and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. And we're going to take that up, looking at it in the uh, New English translation as well, just to keep it simple today. So the focus, though, that I have upon my heart tonight as we look at that word prophet, if you were to look at and do a search of prophet in Scripture, you'd see that word identified and spoken of 67 different times. But tonight, with God's help, I'm looking at what Paul says as he reflects on his past life, his previous life, and he says these words, but what things or what assets were gain, the Greek word there would be gains in plural, to me, for so for what things or what assets were gains to me, those, he says, I counted loss or singular or liabilities were lost for Christ. So things that I would have thought were gains, I considered as lost for Christ. You think of the word prophet, you look at the Greek term there would be prophetus or proficio or to profit. It literally means this, to literally proceed forward or to advance. If you're to take an apple, for example, and you wanted to teach a child how to make profit, uh, and the apple was uh, a $5 apple, and it cost you $2 to have that apple on the shelf, your profit, 5 minus 2, would be $3. So it's the acquisition of valuable uh, worth. And when we talk about it in Scripture, when Paul's saying, He's speaking about profit, things that he counts lost for Christ. We're thinking about that acquisition of valuable spiritual growth. And Paul is saying, all my gains that I had with my pedigree, I count as one loss for Christ. So the loss for Christ shows the importance of Paul's relationship with Christ. Very interesting, Paul, uh, sorry, Charles Spurgeon said these words. After 20 years or more of experience, Paul had an opportunity of revising his balance sheet. And looking again at his estimates and seeing whether or not his counting was correct. What was the issue of his latest search? How do matters stand at his last stock taking? He, ex he exclaims with very special emphasis, yea, doubtless, and I count all things, Paul says, but lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. Everything was lost to the apostle Paul when he considered what he had gained through coming to trust Christ for his own personal savior. The day that Christ met him on a road to Damascus and supernaturally transformed Paul's life from that point on. Dave spoke on those words, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world, but he loses his own soul? Or what does a man give in exchange for his soul? I, I asked you kindly today on the call as you listen, but what would it profit if you gained the highest education man could ever get, but you lost your soul? What would it profit if you gained the wealth of the world, but you lost your soul? King Solomon says all the wealth, as he looks at everything in life, he says all is vanity. All, as it were, is a waste. What, what, what would it profit, profit if you gained man's buy-in, as it were? If you gained man's buy-in of the daily costume you wear that everything is great, and every time someone sees you, they think everything's just wonderful, but you lost your soul. 
What would it profit if you gained man's approval in the political world? But you lost your soul. There was a politician in Ireland running for office, and there was a little gospel tent that was put right outside his home, just a block away. And uh, interested, he stopped by one night, and it actually got his attention, and he started attending these meetings. One evening, on a Thursday evening, he came home, and his wife said to him, you need to make a decision. It's either this Christ that you keep talking about and that's new to you and you've come to bring into our home or it's your election. And the man chose the election. A very sad story. Not only did he choose the election, but he died not long after, after that particular election in exchange for his soul, the political arena, the applause of men, and he lost his soul. What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world, but he loses his own soul? I'm not saying it's wrong to be in the political arena or to have the applause of men, but when that came between him and God, it sent his soul into an eternity lost. Claire Elise Boucher, a Canadian musician, artist known as Grimes, recently put her soul. You can Google these things online. Uh, it was in the news recently. She recently put her soul for sale at an auction of $10 million. How valuable, let me ask this question, how valuable does she feel her soul really is? Your soul costs God his son's blood, your soul. There's not a, the amount of money on this earth that could purchase your soul. Christ came to redeem your soul, to purchase it off the dirty shelf in the marketplace of sin and bring you into his family of riches. And the writer, as Jesus is speaking, he's saying, what are you willing to give in exchange for your soul? Maybe it's popularity. Maybe it's Instagram likes. Maybe it's Facebook followers. Maybe it's the social media stardom. Maybe it's athleticism. What obstacle? stops you from coming to Christ because the Bible teaches that Jesus is the, the son of man who has come to seek and to save them that are lost. And he's constantly seeking. He's constantly saving. And I ask you today, what is the obstacle? What stops you from coming to trust Christ? Now let's get back to Paul because it's a beautiful story here. He's reflecting back to his testimony. He's reflecting back to when he met Christ on a road to Damascus. And each on the call, if you're saved by the blood of Christ and you're saved and you're on your way to heaven, there's a day when you were born again. You can reflect on your personal story. It was the best day of your life, I guarantee you. If you're lost and you've never had that time in your life when you came to the cross with eyes of faith and saw that Jesus Christ died for your sins, the Bible teaches me that you're lost. The Bible teaches me that you're in need of a savior. But the good news is this, that you could have them tonight before the meeting is over. There's two things about Paul's statement, and I'm going to touch on them just this evening. One is the worldly prophet that Paul is speaking about and heavenly prophet. Worldly prophet and heavenly prophet. I ask the question when I say those two terms as far as two different prophets, what do you feel is more weightier? What's more valuable? What's more indispensable, worldly prophet or heavenly prophet? Let's just touch worldly prophet to get this started here. But Paul had so many things going for him that were a huge prophet as a Drew. He had bragging rights. Maybe there's someone on the call today and you say, listen, if you only knew, Matt, my backstory, if you only knew my family, if you only knew what part of town I come from, if you only knew, Matt, what church I belong to, this was Paul. Circumcised the eighth day, that meant, meant all his life he would have lived in Jewish faith. He's from the people of Israel. He continues writing this in this book that we're reading here today. He's from the people of Israel. You know, I'm French and I'm Irish, but Paul here was pure racial ancestry, He's pure Israelite. He had bragging rights to this. He's from the tribe of Benjamin. You might think, well, maybe that, I don't know what that, uh, that means, right? I don't really understand that. But listen, for the tribe of Benjamin, famous for its military power, it would be like us uh, perhaps saying today, I'm a Marine, the few, the proud, the always faithful. He's from the tribe of Benjamin. It would have been something he could have repeated to others, and they would have respected him for that. This tribe gave Israel her first king, Saul. This tribe, the tribe of Benjamin, aligned itself with faithful Judah when Israel divided into two nations at a time of Rehoboam. You find that in 1 Kings chapter 12. It's also the same tribe that had a city of Jerusalem within its boundaries. Paul had bragging rights. He could look to his pedigree. He could look to his background and say, hey, this is who I am. He was a Hebrew and Hebrews. He wasn't like the other Jews that perhaps had fell and embraced the Greek culture. Paul was a Jew through and through, if I could use that terminology. He was a Pharisee. He was part of a religious political party of over 6,000 elites, as they would call it. Faultless as far as the law was concerned. That's what Paul's talking about. Today, he would have been the one who attended every church service. He would have been the one who attended every revival, every concert, every church outing. He would have perhaps taught Sunday school. He perhaps would have preached at every Bible conference. He perhaps would have called on the sick and the discouraged. He was the jack of all trades, 
if you could say that. He was good at everything. But what about you? What worldly profits have you accumulated? Worldly accomplishments that mean so much that it gives us a sense of pride. Worldly position, worldly honor. And if it came to giving those up, as Dave already mentioned it just tonight, if it came to giving those up just for Christ, to give your worldly profit, to push that to the side, to gain Christ tonight, could you do it? Would you do it? He's calling. He's calling the prodigal to come. We've said it every night. Him that comes to me, I will in no wise cast out. Paul says, all my gains in the past, I count as one loss for Christ. Believer on the call. If I can just speak to you just for a moment. Are we willing to give the world's gains for Christ? It's amazing to have gospel series and maybe gospel meetings and different speakers. And then we meet for a prayer call. And perhaps there's two on a prayer call out of a church setting of 60 or 100. We wonder, where's our, lo- where's our love for the lost? Hundreds perishing. Where's our, where's our passion to reach people for Christ? Our desire to see souls saved. Our cohesiveness, our support, our camaraderie as a church family and as a body. Our desire to see souls one to Christ. Our desire to see souls like Paul who was once lost in his sins. And he comes to Christ. He considers the world that sometimes we chase, perhaps unintentionally as believers. He says, that's lost to me, so I can gain Christ. Billy Graham said, to get nations back on their feet, we must first get down on our knees. Charles Spurgeon said, true prayer is neither a mere mental exercise nor a vocal performance. It is far deeper than that. It is a spiritual transaction with the creator of heaven and earth. Surprising when. You meet individuals who don't have time to speak to the creator of heaven and earth. Jesus said, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and he loses his own soul? What are we willing to give in exchange for our souls? I like what Lecrae said. He said, if I'm wrong about God, and he, he's not. But he's saying to unbelievers as he speaks, he says, if I'm wrong about God, then I've just wasted my life. But if you're wrong about God, you've wasted your eternity. John Piper said these words, life is wasted if we do not take the riches or the richness of the cross. I'm using this quote because very interesting when you meet individuals, you find out really what they're made of as they boast perhaps in their background, in their pedigree. As Paul saying, I consider that lost. John Piper said, life is wasted if we do not take the richest of the cross, cherish it for the treasure that it is and stick to it as the highest price of every pleasure and the most comfort in every pain, what was once weakness to us, a crucified God must become our wisdom and our power and our only boast in this world. Paul considers every worldly accomplishment, he says in scripture, as dung in comparison to what he enjoys in Christ. The riches of the work of Calvary, Christ Jesus coming into the world to pay and die for sinners and to be raised again on the third day. Winning souls from every race, every culture every language, every belief system. And God is continuing to this day. He's still saving sinners. We are redeemed through the precious blood of Christ, Paul writes to the church at Colossae. Nothing in my hand I bring, the hymn writer wrote, simply to the cross I cling. Now let's not just look at Paul's world prophet, he considers lost, but now let's look at the heavenly prophet. He lists this true prophet, listen to these words, which came from knowing Christ as his Lord. It's the foundation of Paul's prophet. Can I say those words? His heavenly prophet. He has come to understand that Christ Jesus went to a cross and he died for the apostle Paul. Paul used to be called Saul and now he's, he is called Paul. He says, I consider in verse eight, everything is a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. And in verse eight, English poet Alfred Lord Tennyson said these words, what the sun is to flowers, Christ is to my soul. He is the sun. Of my soul. He's saying these words. He is the life to my soul. Jesus says, as Dave spoke a few days ago, I am come, Jesus says, that they might have life and life more abundantly. John 7 and 38 says, He who believes in me, as the scripture said, out of their hearts will flow rivers of living water. Paul also gained a righteousness he had never known before. Notice verse 9 and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own, but that which is through faith in. Christ to look to have think of these thoughts just for a moment perhaps you're weighed down with the burden of sin and the regret of sin and just the capacity and weight of sin and just consider this to have God look down on you for the very first time in your life if you came to trust Christ today and you've been made right what was broken 
now reconciled. You've come to trust Christ. Sins are forgiven, past, present, and future. And Paul is recognizing this. And he said, this is my prophet, my heavenly prophet. Past righteousness based on his following law of Moses. But to God, when Paul reflects on what he lost in that world, he says, my righteousness, following the law of Moses, to God, that's filthy rags. He finds a new righteousness in Christ. He's been made right through Christ. No matter how good we are, or think we are, our works and our self-made righteousness will never cut it, if I can use those words. We'll never make God's standard. It's impossible, and that is why Christ died for us. Second Corinthians 5, but God made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us, that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Paul gained a fellowship with Christ, which would eventually pay off in a resurrected life. He says, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. Knowing Christ was the highest prophet in Paul's life. Touching quote by Thomas A. Kempis, when we think of the believer's life, in his book, Imitation of Christ, he said these words, Jesus hath many followers of, lover, sorry, Jesus had many lovers of his kingdom, but fewer bearers of his cross. All are disposed to rejoice in him, but few to suffer sorrow for his sake. Many follow him to the breaking of bread, but few to the drinking of his bitter cup. Searching when Paul said, to live is Christ, to die is gain. To see him in eternity was gain for Paul. It's the focus of the believer. So in love with his Savior. No wonder Paul says, thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. Can I say a couple words to the believer and the unbeliever on the call today? I'm going to close with just a little story. To the believer, sad to say that sometimes our passion and our devotion to Christ does fade. It does so unintentionally at times. But can I encourage you today on the call? It doesn't have to stay that way. We can all be renewed in Christ. We can all find profit in life that we never knew existed. It's through a joy. It's through a hope. It's through a peace with God. It's through a relationship, through the person of Christ, through the study of the word of God, and through prayer and daily repentance and dedication to him. To the unbeliever, don't miss out on heavenly profit. Don't miss out on heavenly profit because we're so focused on worldly profit. But what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world, but he loses his own soul? Or what would a man give? in exchange for his soul, to have sins paid for and forgiven, to be reconciled, to know Christ as your savior. It's the highest profitable time in life you will ever have, and not only in life, but for all eternity. When I think of loss, I'm closing. I think of what it costs God to provide salvation and what it costs the sinner. Everything from God paid for, but free for the sinner. When I was 16 years old, uh, I was thinking of cost just today, uh, 16 years old. And I'm thinking about this because my son is going to be 16 soon and have his license. And you, as a father, you you really think about these things. But I wrecked at 16 years old, six of my father's cars at 16. It was my first year of driving. But amazing that when uh, police would have submitted uh, my accidents, the insurance company told me these words. It's free for you because you're under your father's insurance umbrella. Free for you. I didn't pay anything. My father paid everything, and I was under his insurance umbrella. I, I thought of the gospel when you think of these thoughts here. Wouldn't you want to be under the umbrella of grace this evening? Under the Father's umbrella of the work of Christ on a cross that removes the penalty of sins forever. It covers you under his umbrella of sins forgiven. His umbrella of a home in heaven provided for you solely through Christ. What does he say? Him or her that comes to me, I will never cast out. Paul wrote in Romans, the same one who wrote these words that we've been enjoying today. For me to live is Christ. Paul wrote these words, Romans 10. And I use this in the New English translation. Listen to what it says. But what does it say? Verses 8 through 11. The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we preach. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God hath raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Paul's writing here. For with the heart one believes. And thus has righteousness. And with the mouth, one confesses and thus has salvation. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him, believes in Christ, will not be put to shame. You can come to him just the way you are this evening and know for sure sins are forgiven and a home in heaven because Jesus died for you.